Welcome, everybody, to the first ever Safe House podcast. Uh, my name is Andy Denon. I serve as the um, vice president of Safe House, and I also am a trainer, and I work with all the staff, and I uh, sit on the core leadership team and kind of just help drive the vision of the company. This is a uh, podcast that we've been talking about doing for a super long time. Uh, it's going to be available on um Apple iTunes podcast uh, stuff, Spotify, anywhere you can get a podcast. It's also going to be on uh, YouTube, which you can access through youtube.com slash safe house RSD. Uh, and you'll be able to watch it. You can listen to it, share it with your friends. We're going to be trying to engage you guys more. Um, <clears throat> the purpose of this is just to have a conversation about everything, anything, topics, including life and business and leadership and parenting or whatever kind of comes to the surface. And uh, we're just going to talk. I'll be your host. You'll be with me every week. Today, joining me is the, uh, as he will be for the majority of the episodes, is the founder and executive director of Safe House and also my older brother, if you can't tell by looking at us. I'm just kidding. He's my dad. Um, I'm he, the better looking one. He's the better looking one. When we walk into rooms together, people can't tell if we're br brothers or father, son, which I don't know, to be honest, if that's a compliment to you, an insult to me. You look young, I look old. I don't know. Anyway, I don't know. It all depends on how they're saying it. The beard is what I'm looking forward to. I want to get a huge white beard one day that just just that's paint, just, that's all the years. That's what I want. I think the Bible says that white hair is wisdom. I don't know if it's wisdom or just a bunch Which of is stupidity why you have or, the wisdom or, and or, or stress that I've had over the years. Right. Um. His name is Bob. Bob Denon. He uh, he was a pastor for ever uh, before he founded Safe House. He's affectionately known on campus as Pastor Bob. Uh, so welcome. Thanks. So the first ever Safe House podcast. I know you've been bugging me for years forever. to try to do this. Forever. It's like, okay, let's yeah. get it done. We'll just, we'll just, I, if you, if you. <laughs> You're if more you, excited about it than I am right now, but I have a feeling it'll grow If on you me. hound on somebody long enough, it's just, I just, the way I get things done is just to wear people down. That's how it goes. That's right. In the studio with us also behind the cameras, you won't see him, you can hear him every now and then, is Brandon. Um, what's up, Brandon? How you doing, man? I'm not doing too bad. How are you doing? I'm good. Good. It's good to see you. Hey, Brandon. Brandon is the Hello. director of media and IT at Safe House. He also was a lifetime ago a student at what was then the Safe House after school program, Correct. which we had. We'll, we'll talk about all that stuff as we get to know everybody here. Um, but the uh, Safe House after school program was a was open for uh, kids after school in the community. Um. Do you remember when that was? What year? When I first started. When you first started going to the after school program. Uh, I was in fifth grade, so it probably would have been 10 or 11. 10 or 11. We did summer camps that you came to eventually and oh, everything. Yeah, those were the best. Yeah. So we've been doing this for a long time. Brandon, uh, we got reconnected because after you graduated high school That's and right. were no longer a resident or a resident, gosh, a student at the after school program, um, you went on to Kent State, got a degree in. Digital media production. Digital media production. And so we lost contact, and then we got reconnected because Safe House wanted to do a promo, which we'll talk a little right. bit about it, but we're going to send everybody a link. It'll be available on the YouTube and, and everywhere you can access this podcast. But there's a video that has to do with a teddy bear, right. which is basically the vision of why Safe House exists. Right. And so, Brandon, you we connected. I, I think I emailed you or called you or something and said, hey, let's, uh, let's, let's get together. I want to make this thing. Sat down over coffee. We sat down over coffee at ideas. Starbucks in Kent, and that was it. And then you're stuck with us now. Yep. So it's kind of neat left. how things happen. We we seem to have a uh, a history of kids that were in the after school program or have been connected through Safe House one way or another that <laughs> has kind of found their way back to the ministry and what we're doing now. Right. And it's kind of neat when you look at it from the old person that's sitting at the table. To where we're at today on on you know he was he was a you know, little punk running around you know the campgrounds and, and he used after to school steal my he used to steal the camera that you got me when I was in college correct and run around the campus making videos with his buddy yeah uh, <laughs> I'm so glad you're bringing that up. and posting yeah, them on YouTube it. it's just funny because when we sit around and we talk about like whether or not we're doing a good job. Right. We always come back to because you can never tell. Yeah. We're right? always like, you never know. It's, we got to do better. We got to do better. It, I mean, it just drives us crazy on on how much we we constantly are picking ourselves apart. Right. And, and saying we got to do better. And then when you sit down and begin to talk about it and everything that you've done 
uh, you realize that you're not as bad as you think you are. Right. And the impact that it has on people when you didn't realize it does. Right. You know, because right. like when I first messaged Brandon and said, hey, let's let's can you help me with this? You were all in. Like I didn't have I didn't have to sell it or anything. It was a, easy to convince. So that's exciting. What was neat was when he showed up after we hadn't seen him for years. It was like, oh, he's grown up, and but it was like nothing changed. Yeah, you know, it's like all those years went by. It's like, oh yeah, it's Brandon. He just has a beard now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Only difference is the beard. I'm still kidding. Hard. Still a kid. Uh, hard. Yeah, but he's pretty smart right now, though. So I think I you're smarter that. now than you was back then. Probably. Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. A little more educated. Um. But so anyway, that's Brandon. We're excited. You'll hear his voice, and we're, we're you might see him every now and then. We like to keep him tucked in the dark corners for now, though, um, just because that's how when you're a rookie at Safe House, that's the way it goes. I'm totally kidding. That's not true. But anyway, uh, so you today know, kind of is kind of is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what we want to do for you guys today, as you're listening and watching and just hanging out with us, is we just want to let you kind of get to know Safe House a little bit. If you're if you're listening to this like right away, there's probably a lot you already know about safe house and about pastor Bob or about myself. Um, but there's way more to it. There's a lot of stories that have helped us to get to where we are. So we're just going to talk about it today and kind of go wherever it takes us. Um, if you are on, if you're listening to this, we are going to put a link on like the, we have an Instagram, we have a Twitter, we have a Facebook for, for safe house, safe house RSD is what you want to look for. Um, and follow us, like us, you know, connect with us however you can. We're going to post a link to our website, which is safehouserSD.com. And you can go to that website. And then if you search in the menu there, there's a teddy bear tab. And if you click on teddy bear, there's a video that, like we just said, Brandon helped us put together uh, with a huge team from Kent. They were great. Yeah. Was over, over the course of yeah. two or three days, they were all hanging out at my parents' house where we filmed this thing. And it was such a wonderful time. So if you guys are listening to this, by the way, shout out to you guys, because we haven't been able to connect with you since we, uh, since we've finished it. Yeah. It was and great. It was so much fun. It was, it was fun. so much fun connecting with all those people. So, but if you go to safehouserSD.com, click on the teddy bear tab, you can watch this video. It's a five minute short film, uh, that basically tells the story of essentially why the vision of safe house exists and yeah. we'll give you a little snippet there was a teddy bear that was found that dad found outside the mailbox that was all tattered and broken up and the journey that that teddy bear followed from that point on is really kind of the story it, behind why safe house exists. yeah it really it it became a, a place within the history of the organization of where we shifted into a, a new mindset of wounded people Right. That we needed to reach out to. And like I mean, a whole group that we didn't even know really existed. Correct. At that point. Correct. It, I mean, it was definitely God ordained that we found it and the vision that he gave me when when we picked it up and it went through its little process that it went through. Um, and without going over and over again, uh, I know that everybody wants me to tell the teddy bear story, but I've told it for so long. I mean, literally thousands of that times. That I don't do it justice. That's why we did the video. Right. Is because it's kind of. Oh, it's the teddy bear story, but to a lot of people, it means more than right. than I can give to it anymore. That's why we're trying to we're really trying to put more in the video um, and into things like this because there's a there's a lot of history and there's a lot of lessons to be learned on the process of of what our family has been through yeah. and and where God has taken us from to where He's brought us to today mm -hmm. and and actually what we're doing today. Right, and I think there's incredible leadership. Uh, lessons to be learned, but there's also a lot of hope that if you have a vision or if you have a dream um, or God's planning something with inside of you, you just <laughs> don't know exactly what to do. How how do you go through the process or right. is 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 what I'm going through part of the process? And yeah, I think what we're trying to do is it put put it to instead of putting it in a book, we're trying to put it into video and put it into different things um, and and share the story which is going to take us a while to do yeah. uh, considering the history and the years that we've got and what we're doing. Which speaking of book, we also have like a short story form of Correct. the teddy bear story that we did. And it, it's kind of fun because we did it from the perspective of you telling the story. Right. And if you flip the book over, there's a, uh, this, the story of the actual, what the teddy bear would have been experiencing. Correct. Time, Correct. Which and I think, I think we ought to make that, you know, if they want it, put a link on the yeah, web page we that they we, could request one. We'll send it to it them. It doesn't cost anything. If you want to read that, we'll just send it out, out sure. to you. You know, we'll, we can come up with a contact form that we can put on uh, our social media stuff and the website, and you can ask for it, and we'll get you a copy of that book. Um, so the uh, 
we're also going to do a short film of the teddy bear side. Correct. We're gonna. Yeah. That's that's something that Brandon and I have discussed, and that we're gonna we're gonna do. That one's going to be, I think, a little more intense than the actual teddy bear. The one yeah, that it's going to be it more did. of a story than like a you yeah. just talking yeah. about it. Yeah, I think it'll be fun. So safehouserd.com. Um, look for the teddy bear tab. Look that up. We'd love to hear your thoughts on it, uh, and 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 just to kind of catch the vision of what we do. Now, and I would say if you also see it and watch it, share it. Yeah. Um, I know that you know we have a lot of people that's on my Facebook page that has already seen it, but I think we're going to repost it uh, here in the next couple weeks or maybe in the next month. And and I've got a lot of new friends. I've I've been able I've been blessed been able to connect with a lot of people via social media because of all the people that I've met when I've been doing some of the fishing right. I've been doing. Yeah. So it's kind of neat. Um, let's give everybody just a little bit like of a brief history of kind of how you got into what you're doing. And then we'll talk about kind of the history of the company. Okay. You, I remember when I was a kid and um, we lived in Elyria, you would, you worked at Murphy's Oil Soap mm-hmm. and then you came home, you would change your clothes and you'd load up a trailer and go cut grass. Correct. Right. And yeah. so, and that was business you owned, right? Correct. Like Murphy's, you were on the line for a while and then you moved your way up. Started Murphy's. Ranks. It was uh, a 1980. Which by the way, Murphy's Oil Soap is my favorite smell ever. I keep a bottle in my garage. I'm not kidding. I keep a bottle in my garage and whenever I walk out to the garage to do something, I open it up. I, I, smell it which is not it doesn't it's not like a bad like where i'm like sitting there like inhaling right. i just like the smell okay and because i remember it's not like you're huffing it or yeah anything, nothing right? crazy okay. okay and this isn't like confession okay <laughs> this is like just me being excited about <laughs> a smell because they say scent is the or the scent uh, smell is the sensation the the sense most closely tied to memory right and right. so i uh i will will take a, a smell of it whiff just sounds bad i don't know anyway uh, because I remember when you come home from work and I'd go running into the front door, I'd bury my face in his your Carhartt jacket, right, right, right. and it just smelled like, which is a different sensation than when you smell it. Like you yeah. smell it now, and you're I like, smell oh it my now gosh, like, no. please, I just can't take it. <laughs> but I smell it. I'm like, this is dead. He's home. Yeah, Yay! Yeah. What and a so, great company. It was a, a, it was one of those God moments. Uh, in 1980, uh, you know, we had some real bad things going on we had the oil embargo which was causing you know gas lines and rations of the gas and uh, i think that was happening in the late 70s and 1980 it just wasn't a good economy at all and um we moved i at that point i had been transit i moved from cambridge where i grew up and moved into with a pastor friend of mine ed wilson if ed wilson's watching this what an incredible time we had for about a year or so as as far as him mentoring me and um, and, and then, um, I met my wife, um, which at that time was through just singing at a couple conventions and, and through dad a, was in a band. He was a drummer yeah, in a band. Yeah. I was a drummer in a band called surrender. They, they have an album. <clears throat> yep. They yep. have an album. Absolutely. We have a record. We have a vinyl at home. Yeah. I don't know if that's something I want to remember or not. No, I'm oh, just joking. We're going to, we're, um, I'm going to figure out a way to digitize it and we're yeah, absolutely going to yeah. post it somewhere. Yeah, but those guys were great too. And that was, uh, that was in a crucial time of my life where I was kind of searching and looking for myself and, and trying to figure out, you know, what I was going to be in life. And really all I wanted to do was to work. And um, I remember um, that I had lost the job uh, because they'd laid off in Newark, Ohio, which I was a crane operator for a steel company and they basically shut down. And I went for a period of time where I didn't have any money. um, And I think I had 10 bucks in my pocket and half a tank of gas. At that time I'd been sleeping in the backseat of my car um, and I had put in like 160 some applications within a week because I was just desperately trying to find work. Right. And, um, and how old were you at this point? Um, 18, 19, 20, something around there, probably closer to 20. Um, and, um, thought I had a job that next morning was promising at McDonald's. Um, and so I drove into Cleveland. I had called, they said they were hiring. And, of course, this old Chevy that I had had bald tires on it. Didn't realize that Cleveland at that time has lake lake effect snow storm. Yeah. And so on that particular night, we got hit with like nine inches of snow that I wasn't prepared for. And I got stuck on a hill. And I couldn't I, – I actually could not make my appointment. I was 45 minutes late for my appointment because I got stuck. And I didn't get the job. And I remember being so mad because I had 10 bucks in my pocket. I had nowhere to stay for the night, and I just didn't get a job at McDonald's. 
And I remember driving past the airport in Cleveland there, Cleveland Ho- Hospin- Ho- Hopkins, Hop- yeah. Hopkins Airport. And I actually lit, literally raised my fist and punched the top of the car from the inside. And, and I screamed at God and I said, what is it? Do you want me to die? And I, I at that particular moment, I felt so alone and felt like I was just um, that no one cared about me. And I remember just punching, you know, being so mad and screaming um, because it just seemed like nothing was going to happen. I was going to have to decide, am I going to put the $10 in food or am I going to put it in a gas tank? And, and I really had nowhere to go after that. We, I, I had met Angie, and we were talking and dating and doing some different things, but I was still looking for a job at that time. And um, I don't remember how it happened, but I had called a friend from a, a, a phone booth, and he said, hey, I hear that this company called Murphy Phoenix Company is going yeah. to hire or they're hiring. And I said, where's it at? And he gave me the address. And at that time, we didn't have GPS. I still don't know how I found it. I guess I was just jotting was down directions. This was pre-MapQuest days. Too. Yeah, I, I mean, I'd never just... been in Cleveland, and it was a miracle that I actually found the place. I remember going in, and I was so good at filling out applications. It was like a two-page application. I could fill it out without even thinking about it because I'd filled so many out. And I remember going to the window, and this little short guy with a mustache showed up, and and he, he said, can I help you? And I said, I'm wanting to know if you're hiring. He said, well, we're taking applications. And I remember I was not in a good mood that day. And I said, I'm not, I'm, I said, I'm not interested in you taking an application. I'm interested, are you hiring? I said, 160 other people are taking applications. I said, I need to know if you're hiring. Right. And he said, he started laughing. He goes, yeah, we're hiring. And he kind of laughed at me. And so I filled the application out. He looked it over. They brought me in a room, inter, uh, interviewed me. He said, okay, so we, we got to check some things out. We'll call you. And I didn't have a phone, so the phone number that I had left was for a payphone. Oh my gosh! That was on the other side of Cleveland, <laughs> and and I went there, and I said, "Okay, I'll be at this phone." I said, "I need you to call." How did you the know the, the number day. of a payphone? I had went there because I had no place to stay, so I went to the payphone, and the payphone had a number on it. So, so you those just were the hung numbers. Hung out by a payphone until he called. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and so I went and sat by the payphone, and two two thirty, no phone calls. And I was upset because the end of the day was coming up. So right. I called Murphy Phoenix Company, called back. From the same one? From you the, called them? I called them. Okay. Okay, it cost me a quarter. That's okay. <laughs> it's Put my the last quarter. quarter. All right. And, and I called him, and I was mad at him. And his name's Mr. Moss. And I said, I said, listen, I said, you told me you would call me back. Well, they haven't called you yet. And I said, no, no one's called me. I've been standing at this payphone I, all day. And it was freezing cold. It was, I mean, it was just nuts. And. He said, yeah, can you get down to the union hall before 3 o'clock? It was like 2.40 <laughs> or something like that. And I said, why? He said, you have to sign up with the union hall before you can start working. And I, I didn't know anything about union halls right. or unions yeah. or anything like that. I just wanted to work. I didn't even know what really what they did. I was just kind of looking for a job. Right. And uh, long story short was uh, some one of their guys in shipping gave me directions how to get downtown. So I drove to downtown Cleveland. Never been to downtown Cleveland in my life. And um, found the union hall two minutes before, signed up, and then I was able to start at Murphy Phoenix Company the next day. Wow. Which Murphy Phoenix Company was making Murphy's Oil Soap. Right. And I worked for Murphy Phoenix Company for uh, like 15 14 years, or something, years right? something like that. You were coming that. up on – because yeah. I remember I – remember Well, I kind of worked for Murphy Phoenix Company for nine years. And, and then, then it Mur- was Colgate. Yeah, then they sold to bottom, Colgate. Bottom. Right, right, bottom out, and I worked but for Colgate for But you were still making – so Murphy's, Murphy's also, also correct because they didn't like dissolve that right. or whatever. The neat thing about it was I started just packing boxes um, on a line, and within a year I was in the compound department making the stuff. And then they decided to build a new plant a couple years after that. And the old guys that were working, his name was Jay. I'll never forget Jay. Jay was I working. Jay. Yeah, Jay was working. Uh, and compounding, and he didn't want to go into new technology. Right. And he wanted to stick with the old stuff that they were doing, which was just making it in a big vat. And it was hot and it was nasty. And so I got the opportunity to move with the, the into the new building and do what's called a continuous batch system. Right. Which they're still doing today. Colgate still does that today. And so I was able to move up through the company just because I wanted to get off the line. No one wanted to work in compounding because it was always so hot in the wintertime and and boiling hot in the summertime. Um, and then I got the opportunity to move in with a new location. And um, so it was kind of a, you know, it was kind of a neat thing that we were able to raise the family. 
Um, and, that, and I mean, that was my entire childhood. Yeah, you know? we were very involved in the local church there in Illyria. You used um, to take me to the factory, yep. like when they would give you permission or whatever. Yeah, well, it was really not permission. It was just kind of on the weekends when nobody oh, else Oh, when was no one was there. Day. Okay, so right, he's just right. been a rebel from yeah, day one and yeah. just made me think that it was like, it's take your kid to work day in a factory with these huge tow motors rolling around. Yeah, but there was not a lot of people there when I would take you. Yeah. You let me ride on a tow motor with you one time. Yeah. I'll never forget it. We were riding, and he goes, you know how strong this thing they is? They call them forklifts today. Tow motors, people are like, that's like using the word commode. Instead of toilet. Well, I don't know you. I yeah. call it what I was told to call yeah. it. Yeah, tow motor. It's a yeah. forklift. The he, forklift. It's yeah. a forklift. Okay, so. so listen, that's your Cambridge coming out, <laughs> and you're you're poisoning me with your Cambridge. Right, right. Uh, so, but he, I was sitting on your lap, just this little kid, and you said, "You know how strong this thing is." I don't know why I'm making your voice like that. You yeah, were talking I, normal. I don't even talk that way. And I said, "How strong, Daddy?" You know, that's exactly what my voice sounded like. And he went, this thing could lift a car. <laughs> and I would just remember thinking, whoa. Mm -hmm. It was just wild. I'm surprised so, we didn't go and lift one, to be honest Yeah, to, it would have been just fun. show you. And then, like, the the, deli the truck delivery drivers, they let me sit in, like, the cab of the truck. Yep. You know, like the big semis or yeah, whatever. I think that was, that was Kevin Latarski. Yes. Kevin Latarski loved you. That was so much fun. Yeah. Um, and so that was my whole childhood. Like, you working at Murphy's, and I remember that. And then when I was 10, we moved from Elyria to, to Liberty. Mm -hmm. because you felt like this impression on your heart from God that it was time to do was something. You had whole, been doing ministry in the local church as like a lay leader, like a non-paid volunteer, correct, like correct. youth pastor. You, and we, we really started Safe House was through a, a, a night that the Lord had kind of laid upon and my heart. And we're talking at this point, we're still living in Elyria. You're still working at Murphy's also. Correct. It's probably like the what, like 1990, right? Like 92 yeah, mom would do better with like the, we're, we're I'm talking gonna, i'm not good with dates so i mean we're talking 30 plus years ago yeah at least yeah we because i was that time, well, i was too young to come to those carmen things. was big on the scene <laughs> remember oh my gosh if anybody listening to this knows that reference yes carmen we need to talk to you i need yeah. to know because that is a throw brand you don't know carmen right now brandon doesn't know carmen um he's he was a contemporary christian music artist that was massive he did free concerts that that sold out he didn't charge any tickets right they would take up an offering halfway through the concert right which probably made more money than the ticket sales would have yeah i remember going to pittsburgh and, this is wild and if you this were is crazy. if you were not in a seat they couldn't start the concert because there was people sitting in the hallway. They didn't sell hours. tickets, and so they, they didn't the people just people let in. they just let people come in. And then at like twenty minutes into the concert, they're like, "If you're if the you don't fire have a marshal seat, marshal said we're going to close it down. If you don't have a seat, you have to leave because they're going to shut us down. We're in like where the Cavs played basketball. Yeah, like in Cleveland, yeah, it was packed. Like it was anyway. So that's a side that I mean, wow, that's a yeah. throwback. Well, anyways, through this I have like this of flood time. of memories coming yeah. back in my head right now. Running <laughs> this, <laughs> you would be in line. We'd be in line for hours. Right. Me and my friends would just run around the con the outside of the arena. Yeah. <laughs> like, I think our parents are at gate B, and we just run around yeah. rolling up and down hills because we didn't worry about any – There's thousands of people. We online. would never do that crazy. now. We don't let our kids walk six feet away from us now. Well, anyways, he – That's wild. He showed different videos, and during one of the videos, I got this thinking that we needed to do a youth group at our church. And, and you were like – you were a kid. We didn't have any teenagers at the church. And we were sitting in church on Sunday night, and this thought came to my mind was grab four, you know, get four or five people in the church after church is over with, and let's let's do a youth night. And <laughs> and what we're going to do, we're going to call T for C, right. Teens for Christ. Teens for Christ. Right. You and, had, and, But I didn't want to say Teens for Christ because I didn't want it to uh, push people that were unchurched to, to show up. So we just called it T for C. Do you remember the airbrush t-shirts that you had yep. made? Mom might still have one. Oh my gosh. Stuck away somewhere. I, I mean, do you remember, Brandon, let me pipe in here. And do you remember the, the trend of airbrush t-shirts? I do like the ones you would get done at the mall at the mall. Like yeah, that's that where we got console. it. Done. We, we went and we commissioned this guy to make like 50, <laughs> like, yeah. Chief, I wasn't a part of it. I just remember them dad whipping out a I box where his biggest full of for white t-shirts. And he was like, this is so good. Like, yeah. <laughs> it yeah. was just, man, the so, trends at the time were yeah, crazy. Yeah. So we, you know, we got with this group of people and I'd asked the pastor, I said, hey, I want to do a youth night. And he's like, we don't have any youth. And I'm like, I know. And so I gathered, I don't know, four or five people. And I said, we want to do a youth night at the church. Um, this was in the 90s somewhere in 1990s area and and i said let's do a youth night we had this building that was in the back of the church and he was like okay go ahead 
And so I looked at the, the team that we had developed, and I said, this is what we're going to do. And they're like, we don't have any teenagers. And I said, all right. I said, I just want you to invite anybody that is a teenager to come to this. We'll have pizza, and we'll have some – I remember we made the board games and different things that came out. And we, we that, I think that was the first time I mean, that it, we built the, the, the torpedo right, ball and thing. Brandon, comment this – you remember Safe House after school program. Yes. Right? It was that this story yeah, was the, the beginning of seat, that. Yeah. Like oh. it's the same idea, but the way that it worked was it was once a month, right? Didn't you only do it once a it month? Was once a month. Start? That was it. And then like eventually the after school program, which is now Refuge, which I run, that's a different topic for a different episode, <clears throat> how that came to be. But it's open every day now. And the after school program, right. once we started Safe House was open every day. But back in the early '90s, this was the first thing, and uh, there was there was a pool. You got you found an old used. We pool found table. an old pool table, and we put all this together in one week. Foosball. I mean, work. and it was just you. Yeah, we invited. Yeah, we had me. one of those. And again, I keep saying we. I want to clarify. I keep saying we. I was you like nine. Yeah. I had nothing to do and with you. This. Were not allowed to. Come. And I wasn't allowed to come. Right. You wouldn't let me come because right. I was too. It was you, for teenagers. You and Courtney wanted to come. You helped me set it up. But I, I would sit you there come. and sign kids in. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. I couldn't go. Right, right. <laughs> and what we ended up doing the whole night was about an hour, hour and a half. We'd have some game time. Then we would show this twenty-minute video from Karma, Carmen. Carmen. Yep. And mm-hmm. and then we would, uh, um, you know, share the gospel after it was over with. And then we'd eat some pizza, and and they would go home. I remember the very first one that we did. Um, we had eighteen, we had eighteen kids there, but only seventeen signed in. And, um. This so was one, really one hadn't signed in. One hadn't signed okay. in, but we had eighteen kids that there were there, and I remember talking to the one little kid. He would, just when he came in, he went to the corner. He he was in the corner. He wouldn't get around anybody, and I I remember picturing in my head today, um, I could still see his face, and um, everybody was busy doing their thing. So I went over to him, tried to talk to him a little bit. And as soon as I tried to talk to him, he went outside. He ran outside, which not knowing at that time that was my first kid running away from me, which happens to seem to be like on a daily basis now. <laughs> um, and, and, and so he was sitting on the, the porch of the church and I went over to him and started talking to him and he began to cry and I, I couldn't even get his name out or anything like that. And he'd only been there a few minutes. And, and I remember talking to him and he told me about how he had snuck out of the house that he was living in, which was in the neighborhood, but he wouldn't tell me where it was at. He told me about how he was being abused and neglected. How he was sexually abused and he was put into, um, at different times he was being placed within like a closet and he had escaped or he had got away and he knew that he had to get back or he's going to get in trouble. Right. And I asked him what brought him here and he, he kept on saying, I don't know. I don't know. And so realizing that I was way over my, my pay grade. I went. Yeah, and I you said, didn't you expect need, this no, kind I said, of I kid when you were talking about this. No, I said I need you to stay here. So I went um, just to the other side of the parking lot to get our pastor. And when I got our pastor and brought him back, the kid was gone. And so I, I thought he was went back inside. So right. I went, I went back inside to look for him, and he there he wasn't there. So I went up to Angie, um, and and I said, Angie, where's the little boy at? And she said, What little boy? And I said, The little boy that was in the corner. She goes, She said, Every, Everybody's I said, here. I said, I said, Go look at the paper. And so she looked at the paper. She goes, these are all the people that I've seen. I said, did you see me over in the corner talking to the little boy? And she said, no, I didn't see I didn't see a little boy. What are you talking about? And so I went around and asked the other workers if they remember seeing the little boy come in. Nobody remembers seeing him come in. So the pastor and I went and searched the neighborhood thinking maybe he's walking away. We never have. We never did find that little boy. OK, that was the only time you ever. That's had the only time I ever him. saw him. But the neat thing, the thing about that night was I remember his story of how he was being abused and neglected, and he felt homeless, and he felt hopeless, I should say. And and at that point, um, I really believe that the the vision was placed within me to do what we're doing today. Now, yeah. I don't know if he was an angel, but I know that the Bible is very clear that it says that we entertain angels unaware. Right. And And I don't know if that was God— bringing someone in, and I got goosebumps talking about it right now, uh, God bringing someone in to actually at that time, way back when we were just starting to do T4C, not even knowing that the safe house was not even a, a blip a on the blip radar. On yeah. thinking of what we were going to be doing, let alone even pastoring a church. Because you're, you're not pastoring. No, nope. You're still working at nope. Murphy's. Yeah, yep. still working just, at Murphy's. You got two kids at home. Yeah, just, you know. you know, living the life. We were making good money, and, 
and and everything was you know just kind of normal and we get up and go to work and then work the church and raise the family and have good times and 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 all that you know it's just kind of what i what i considered to be normal yeah uh, even though i think what we're doing now is normal but it's probably not normal to most people um but i i believe with all of my heart that that night was an ordained moment right in my life with god yeah to place the vision to do what we're doing today and and one of the things that i'm wanting to share with you through these podcasts is um, some of the successes that we've had, but also some of the battles that we've had to endure um, to get to where we're at today, where I believe that that there's this covering over us now um, and that there's this lessons that we've learned and there's these battles that we've um, kind of been able to endure um, as the enemy has tried to destroy what we consider to be and what we know was the vision of what God placed upon our hearts to do back at, T for, at the very first T4C. Um, and we ran a T4C for several months, and then we were um, basically asked to pastor a church in Liberty Township, which is a funny other story because nine months earlier, I was asked to fill in because they were they had a pastor that had stepped aside, and they didn't have anybody to fill in on a Sunday morning service. So I went and just filled in on a Sunday morning service at Liberty um, here in town. Right. And uh, But that was nine months earlier. Right, and I remember because we didn't come with you. Nope, we're, like we were still in at least we were still living right. in Illyria, and I remember you leaving early on a Sunday morning. And we you did were Sunday morning a and a Sunday night. Right, and then you time. and then you came back, and um, and you said it was nine months before that. Yeah, yeah, it was nine months before that, and I remember calling um mom in between because I had nowhere to go, and no one was talking really talking to me. I just preached and then waited for the Sunday night service and then preached again. And I, I remember saying it to Angie. I said, um, I could see I could see myself pastoring here. Right. And I remember walking the property because I had six, seven hours in between services. And I'd walk the property. I remember getting different images of what the property could look like. Right. Because at that time, they didn't have they didn't have a right entrance. You had to go through like a gym, old gym door to get into the church. And there was all. And I remember walking around saying, well, if you do it here and you did this here and you did that there. And I remember talking to mom <laughs> and saying, I could see myself pastoring here. Right. And not even knowing that four or five months after we started T4C, we were asked to start to pastor that church. Right. Because the pastor that they had didn't stay. Yeah. That, that replaced them. And so we made the move yeah. uh, rather quickly. I think we were asked on. A Tuesday, and I think we moved on Friday. I remember you asked the question. We were driving, and you, uh, you know, I'm in behind the driver's seat. Courtney's behind the passenger seat because that's just how we sat when we were driving all as a family. Right. It's me, Courtney, my sister. Uh, which, if you're listening to this, you'll meet her eventually. She also is kind of weird note. because isn't that how your kids sit in a car now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. Courtney is the, uh, she's my little sister. She's three years younger than me, but she's the um, cl uh, clinical coordinator, and right. case management supervisor at Safe House. Right. And um, Probably she's, the smartest person she's in easily our, the highest qualified as far yeah. as like credentials go. She's a licensed independent social worker supervisor. So she's fantastic. Also to brag a little bit, proud big brother. She's also one of like six people certified in that uh, trauma, like the brain trauma. Brain mapping. Yeah. Brain mapping state. stuff. Yeah. So. Um, awesome, like state of the art. Her story, you have to get her into one so of these because we'll, her we'll, story's kind of we'll, neat we'll too. meet her, and, and yeah. she's she's terrific. One of my favorite people ever. But we'd be, you asked us, you know, <laughs> and we grew up in a church. We grew up in a Christian home. We grew up. Uh, we went to Christian schools, and I mean, we the the first like non Christian like like thing that we did as far as like education and stuff goes when we both went to a, to a state university. Right. We went to Christian schools. We, we went to church two times on Sunday, once every Wednesday. I mean, it was just the, that way for our entire lives. And you asked us, we were driving, you said, how do you guys feel about being PKs? Because in the church world, a PK right. is like a thing. Right? right. And I remember going, what's a PK? Yeah, exactly. And he said a pastor's kid. And I'm nine maybe at this point. I know we moved when I was 10. So we're like at right, nine, 10 years old. And I remember going, okay, and, I, and and Courtney was like, I don't know what that is. And, you know, yeah. again, I don't know why I'd make her voice like that. She was six. Um, and so, but she didn't know what it was. We didn't care, whatever. My son's seven now. I can't imagine going, how do you feel about being a PK? And you'd be like, right. I don't care. Okay, whatever. And um, But I remember thinking at that point, wow, that's going to be a huge responsibility. I need to be ready for that. And then I don't know how many weeks or months or whatever later it was, you came to us in our bedrooms and you said, hey, we're, we're going to be moving. Yeah. 
And I remember, and this has just been a thread throughout my entire life. I, I said, okay, you left the room. This is a true story. I got a box out. I don't even know where the box came from. It was sitting right. in my closet, some yeah. old cardboard box or something. I put everything that was in my closet in it, everything in my drawers, took them out, put it in it. And again, I'm 10. And I walked out to the kitchen. And I said, I'm all packed. Yeah. Right. And you, yeah. you and mom, I remember you both, mom, both looking at me going, okay. Right. And literally my room was done. Like I packed right. my room yeah. and I was right. And that's always been a thread for me is like when it's time to do what's next, like it's time to do what's next, right. you know? And, um, Courtney was never that she's way. She's always had, she always liked the consistency of what was there. Right. And always change, been very change consistent. was always, has always been a, uh, a process that she has to work through when we when we have her on we're going to ask her to just tell her side of the yeah, story and yeah. i can't wait to hear the diff like the 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 way that That'll probably her... be something I'll, I'll learn for the first time in my life <laughs> how the, she felt about the, it. Kind, like, probably the reason she... why i focus in on brain trauma is because i got yeah, some yeah exactly thanks a lot no yeah. um but that's that's the story of how we ended up at the church at liberty correct right yeah and so just kind of following the thread of how safe house started you were a lay like a youth pastor an unpaid volunteer youth pastor that did a once a month thing for kids correct and then that story about that kid i've heard you tell that a dozen plus times and every time i just am like no like I, you almost can't believe it right, right but but that kid or whatever was just this the beginning of this type of individual yeah i mean that, if i actually close my eyes i can see you him. can picture him I, I can feel the air night. Right. I mean, it was it was, it was a, a moment. moment. Yeah. It was a moment that you you can't deny. It right. wasn't you, just a passing thing that came by with, oh, yeah, I kind of remember. No, I can bring this memory back. In like it happened five full minutes ago. color at yeah. any time, right. even though it's been 30 years plus. Yeah, at least. Yeah. For sure. And, and so I truly believe that um, with all of my heart that, this was a God moment. And that was the beginning of the seed that's grown into what we're doing now. Absolutely. Without a doubt. Absolutely. Because every time I go back and I look at it, what the, the young people that we're helping today have the same exact story as him. Right. And this and what's odd about it, too, is that when we tell people what we do and we, you know, due to, you know, confidentiality and stuff, we're not allowed to go into great detail about when we talk to people outside of the company about some of the stories that right. we see. Right. Right. But when we are able to share some parts of it, people are blown away. They can't believe it happens. Right. And and the world's different now than it was 30 years ago. And it, yeah. it's not as shocking that it happens. Fast, right. Yeah. But but when you go three decades ago. Right. It's like it would have blown. I mean, it would have been impossible to fathom. But fast. That this is happening. What, what I like to do today a little bit is fast forward to 2014, 2015. So, so we so we landed in the church in what was it? Ninety five is when we landed in. Liberty. Liberty. Okay. Right. So you pastored for 10 years mm -hmm. and then around 2000 ish, we started the after school program and we'll tell that story another yeah, day, but we yeah. started an after school program and then, and then through the after school program, this like stirring started to happen in your heart that we could do some more, do right? More, we, the right. church needs to be more about kids. Correct. That's when you came across the teddy bear outside Correct. the mailbox, which yep. again, watch that story. And then, um, and then because of the teddy bear, there was this idea to start a residential treatment facility. Right. And so we went through the residential treatment facility mm -hmm. and you started it and it has its own set of stories. And we're going to tell all of these. We, we don't we right. want to be sensitive to time, but we're going to tell all these stories over the next several weeks uh, as we just and what we learned from them, too. And so um, we, we were in one location. We grew. We kind of outgrew that one or we decided it would be more prudent to move to a different one. Right. So we moved to a different one and then through a series of events, we needed to be and we needed to get out of that one. And we had a plan that was a long term plan Correct. Just to build our own stuff. We weren't right. going to we didn't want to be tenants. We didn't no. want to rent. We wanted no. to have more control. And over we it. and there about a year prior to what I call event number six, like the, the sixth big benchmark moment yeah, in the yeah. history of the company. Yeah, there's probably more, but I think there's at least six that kind of define. Right. And so. A year and a half before number six, we had decided to to buy some property um, on the At east side of Youngstown. Youngstown. Right. And so we got with the land bank and there was a basically an abandoned um, neighborhood. And the reason why it was abandoned is because um, there had been a um, supermax prison built at the end of the road. Right. And Literally so, right behind the property. Right. Right. And so um, nobody wanted we to saw I think there was two acres available the first time with an old house on it. So we bought that. And over a period of about a year, we ended up getting, I think, the 13 or 14 acres that we have right now 
and and we just was didn't we was like well one day we'll build right you know one day we'll yeah build. we're gonna put some money we don't want to get a loan we want right. to put cash away Correct. we want to be able to build Correct. with cash right and at that time we were renting a building then we had a good relationship with the with, with the, the owner, ministry the, that, that owned, owned the property and that's another story how even that building came about um and and what God ended up doing with that but we we basically had a falling out with them it they, just, it they was, they wanted some stuff to happen that we couldn't do right? and just wasn't good business for us. And um, we had a falling out with them. And um, long story short, maybe we can get into a little detail because I really want to spend a little bit of time on what happened on the property, our new property. Um, we were forced to leave. Um, in fact, unexpectedly. We were on our way down to vacation. We were on vacation when we got the call we got that a phone we had call been evicted. Three, and we had three days. We had three days to vacate the we property. We were on our way down to a two-week vacation in South Carolina, yep. which is an annual thing. And on the way down, we got a call that we had three days to get out of the building. And at this point, we had, what, 30, 27, 25 kids like in that yeah, ballpark? Yeah, probably around that. And we're like, "There's, it's not going to happen. So, so we were able to come to terms in an agreement that gave us enough time. Long story to, short. To accelerate what was at that point a two, three year plan. Well, part of the process was to build. We were forced. This was in um, August. I remember spending the whole two vacation, weeks on vacation making talking phone to calls. our attorneys. Well, we had you, you and, we had looked up flights that you might have to fly back right, and forth or we right. might have to cancel the whole vacation. And it so, was a, It was a nightmare. Yeah, it was incredible. I, I couldn't believe that we still went through it. And, and I, I know that I got our attorney involved. And the thing that bothered me was that this other organization was a Christian organization. And our attorney said, the only way that you're going to be able to save the company by not being uh, forced to move out, you got to sue them. Right, which we didn't want and, to do. Which we, me, you, and TJ, and the family, um, TJ's our administrator, which is another story on how he came about to be where he's at. Um, we all sat down and really fought the whole thing that we were going to have to sue this we ministry. Want, we didn't want to get into a litigious battle right. with another right. and organization. We, didn't, we really people. didn't like the way it was going to look in the papers and blah, blah, blah. And, and it, was so, a, it was a struggle. It, was a, we it was a real struggle. So we we followed directions of the attorney and we, we filed suit against them, which got us an appointment in front of the judge. And he gave us a stay. Now, right. this was October. Um, we were supposed to be out the end of August. He gave us 30 days, and then we had the court hearing. And so we went before the judge. First of all, he asked them if we had ever been late, if we had ever missed a payment. And at that time, we had put a lot of money into the actual building to help them because they couldn't make everything happen the way it needed to be. I think we had like $250,000 of our own money into just the, to keep the building the going. Space it was this old hospital that had been converted, and it was really just this— it was a financial elephant um, for everybody that was in there. And um, it, they were really struggling to try to keep the thing open. And so long, very long story short, we ended up getting a stay um, for 30 to 45 days, went before the judge. The judge kind of scolded both of us uh, that we were both Christian companies and we were before him because he was a Christian. I remember sitting there and not feeling really good about that. And, um, he said, how much time do you need, Bob? And, yeah. and I said, um, end of February. And at that time, I was assuming that we probably would just find another building and move into it. Right. Now, keep in mind, we'd moved several times. And each time that we had moved, it cost us about a million dollars to move. And it really was putting stress on the organization over the years. And, and even though we were able to take care of that debt over a period of time, I, I was facing this and saying, holy cow we're gonna what is this gonna cost us and then i was looking at old buildings that we were gonna have to redo it was gonna cost us millions of dollars to do it and so i've forgotten about that yeah. i remember there was a two-week period where we were like you were taking tours of uh old, old buildings they're old buildings and yeah it's it just nuts. like random banquet halls that we yeah. were gonna convert and, and at stuff. that time we we didn't have any debt we everything was you know cash and and we were doing fairly well within the organization at that time financially and um, just out of the blue, we decided to go ahead and start clearing the land. So we started to clear the land, and we realized that we were going to have to build four group homes or four residential homes within the campus. We had the campus all planned. We've been planning the campus for years. and um, But we were coming into winter, and it looked like we weren't we wasn't going to be able to get the— This is— um. To, to get the time. October still at this point? This is October, early October now. November. Yeah, it was early October. And um, 
so I'm trying to shrink the story just a little bit. So we had till November or February 29th to be out. It just happened to be a leap year. The following year yep. was a leap year. Yeah, and we needed <laughs> and November so or February 29th to be out. Hearing after hearing and, and motion yeah, after motion. Yeah, he basically said, okay, you got till the end of February. Uh, go but, do and then it. you're done. Like whatever, yep. whatever you February gotta, you're 29th. You're going to have to move. You're or gonna you're going to have to shut down. Right. And So um, we started, you clearing land. So we started to clear land and we needed some things to happen. Um, I had a bank that was interested in us. We had a contractor. We'd got all the prints done. I had an architect, and we knew what the place was going to look like, and we had the, the price tag on it, but I didn't have the funding. And the bank was going to require $500,000 down as a down payment to start it, which we didn't have. Right. Okay? Um, and so we were scrambling trying to figure out, well, how do we get that down payment? And they were like, it's got to be cash in your account. Um, you can't go borrow from somewhere. We're not going to. And at that point, we didn't have any, um, we didn't own anything. Yeah. Um, I think we were still working on the refuge building, which was the after school building, but that wasn't paid off. We were just making payments on that. Yeah. And um, so we were we were struggling. I remember it was a, a hot day. Uh, TJ and myself was over there clearing the You're land on and, the land and we're clearing, clearing it. And <clears throat> with um, no actual plans at well, this point in stone to start building. Nope. we, we had a contractor working. on hold. He would basically pulled his equipment because I didn't have any funding in place. And he's like, when you get funding in place, we'll move back in. So TJ and I went and rented some equipment. We were just kind of clearing the land. And and I remember being pretty stressed um, about it and thinking, we need to put the first foundation in in the next couple of weeks or we're not going to make it. And we had decided we were going to build because every other place that we had reached out to was going to cost us twice as much as it right. would to build, yeah. to revamp it and and – it was it was a mess. It was a complete mess, and and I remember night after night praying and walking the floor and getting up early in the morning and walking the street where the property was and trying to find out what we were supposed to be doing. And on this particular day, we were um, we were clearing the land, and it was at the end of the day. It was like five o'clock, and I had dust all over me, and um, it you could hear thunder in, in the distance, but we hadn't seen any clouds or nothing, and so I knew we were going to get wet here in a little bit. And this guy that um, I think you had met, it was a pastor that you had met, and oh, maybe told him about the story I, of what we, was going on. Refuge was, this was after the Safe House After School program had like ceased operations. And again, another great story, but Refuge had been in operation for a while, and we right. started a second campus in Hubbard. Right. I, I remember this now. His and name was... And he, this, we, what was his name? Brad. Right. Past, Pastor, Pastor Brad. Brad Bloomster. Yeah. I only ran into him once and passing he, him. He, he, he was the pastor of the church that we were doing the Hubbard campus refuge in. We were right. doing two days a week, just four or five hours of programming a day. And I had with nothing kids to do in the with Hubbard that. community. That was all refuge, all yeah, me correct. and the team that we had put together in the Hubbard community. But he had been like asking about like the history and how we got to where we are. And I told him, I had told him this, the teddy bear story. Right. Because that was kind of how we, we all kind of use that story as like motivation and, and inspiration for what we were doing. And he was just blown away by it. I, I didn't know. I, I knew you had told me this story before, but I had forgotten until just now yeah, it was, that that was the man that came and talked to you. Correct. So he, 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 he pulled because up. of that story, he came and was driving around and he asked if he could, he asked me if he could meet you. Right. And I told him where the campus was going to be when it was time to build where the property right. was at right. that point. Okay. So go ahead. So, so he, came. he pulls up. And um, at that time, you can he hear the thunder in the background. This is wild. And um, I'm pretty stressed. I mean, I'm 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 pretty whacked out uh, trying to figure out. I'm, I'm thinking we're going to have to close down. And the problem is, is that you just can't close down a residential and open it back up. I mean, we have licensing with the state. There was a bunch of stuff that was going on. I mean, and that takes years. Yes. Like to yeah, do it right. Yeah. And once you get closed down, you can get this like blacklist. And it was just it was bad. Not to mention all the kids were serving. Correct. They and, have to and, find new right. homes. And we were we were I was worried about where's the kids going to go and where's the staff going to go and and trying to keep everybody working. And uh, he, he drives up, and I remember seeing him, and he introduced himself. I said, oh, yeah, we ran into you with Andy. And, and he said, um, so why do you think you're going through what you're going through? And, and you I have thought no was, history with him. None, I had no history with him we were, up to this I point either, except the, for just refuge. I can take it to the place on the street yeah, where, he yeah, was, yeah. where we were talking. And TJ at that point had left. Mm -hmm. uh, it, we knew it was going to rain, so we had the equipment sitting off to the side, and he left. And so it was just me and him that was standing there. And he and I said, why? I said, he said, why do you think you're going through this? What what's what do you think the reason is? And I said, well, I, I believe it's, you know, I'm my faith is being tested. 
and and I'm going to believe in God. And you know, you're at that moment where you say it, but you don't know if you believe it. You or almost not. like you got to fake it till you make it, right? You almost hope. Well, that you say that it. You believe it. You I, you believe I, I think, it, but you're almost trying to convince yourself at I the same time. I think you say it so that you can believe it. Right. No, I get and, it. And even though I didn't see any. I hadn't seen anything that would say that nothing was going to change that day. I still had the history of the other five things that we went through that God had never failed us. Right. And, and as a family that God had never failed us. And so there was this blind faith that was there. Yeah. Me saying this just has to do with my, my faith in God and I'm not going to waver from it. And he looked at me and said, you don't have a clue. And I thought, who is this, Who's guy? this guy? Yeah. You know, and he goes, this has nothing to do with your faith. And I and at that time it started to rain. It, so it was raining is what it was doing. Um, and the storm was kind of up on us. Now, the storm had stayed to the um, north of us a little bit. And we were just getting the back end of it off of the north end. And, and the storm was there. And it, and so we got a little bit of rain, but not enough to really soak everything. But it was enough to make the dust on me mud. Yeah. I remember that. And I said, excuse me. And he said, this has nothing to do with your faith. I said, well, would you like, you know, like smarty pants? You know, would you like to? <laughs> why don't would you, you clarify? Yeah, why don't you clarify with that? He goes, this has everything to do with God's faith in you. And I remember s- standing there and I said, what? He said, this has everything to do with God's faith in you. And I remember just feeling a warmness come over my body and I began to cry. Yeah. Um, and I said, I've never heard of that in my life. And I mean, I, I wept. And and he 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 looked at me a big old smile on his face and he said, and I think God's trying to tell you something. I said, Well, okay. And I'll keep in mind we needed a half million dollars and we needed some things to come about that we had no plan whatsoever when he was talking to me. Right. All we had was blind faith in yeah. God. And and he goes, And I think God's trying to tell you something. And I said, Why? He said, Look over your shoulder. And when I looked over my shoulder, and well, I think you're gonna have a picture of it. Yeah, there's a, we you sent yeah. me a picture. Yeah. When I looked over the shoulder, there was this huge rainbow that had showed up and basically over the, property. over the property that was setting where we hadn't cleared trees yet, but where the trees are cleared now would be where house C is. Our, would, and we have our, we label our houses A, B, C, and D. So it's right. one of the four original houses that were built on Correct. the campus. And, and I remember the warmness coming over me and God just saying, trust me, I need you to go through this. And I remember going home, n- not having any plan at all. And, um, I think it was late at night. We had we had talked to a person that had some money, and he basically had said that he didn't want to help us. And I talked to a couple other people that had been given donations over the years, and they said, we're not going to help you. And um, and I remember that night I got a phone call. It was probably 8, 8, 30, and said, can you meet me at Bob Evans tomorrow from this guy that I had met one time? And I said, yeah. I said, what time? He says, how about 4 a.m.? I said, are they even open at 4 a.m.? And he says, I think they open at 5 or 4.30 or 5. And I said, okay, I'll meet you there. So we met like early. It was early in the morning. And I remember sitting there and he said, so so tell me what, what you're going through. And I began to tell him what we're going through. And he just looked at me like it was nothing. And he said, so um, you need me to cut a check for $500,000 to you right now. <laughs> and I said, what? And he said, I'm going to give you the 500000 And I said, what? And I, I thought we we're just having a donut. I was going to cast a vision, and maybe right. maybe he would help us in one way or another. And he go, I said, he, and so he pulls out his checkbook, and he's getting ready to cut a personal check. And I said, well, wouldn't you think it'd be better with that much money that we would do a wire transfer? And he goes, yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> and um, and he became the hero of the moment. Yeah. And I remember getting the money, putting it in. It got put in the bank that day. I went to the bank. I said, we got to expedite. I need the paperwork done. I went to the contractor the next morning. He said, we're coming up against winter. He said, I don't know if we can accomplish or not. And I remember. Yeah, we're, we're, it, what is it, November? It's no. It, well, it's starting to be. We're going we're into like November. Turning in right. And, right. I mean, you can't build. And, well, we had all infrastructure ready to put in. We yeah, had tons of stuff you gotta we like to put into You got to pour concrete for, right. for the footers. Well, like, all I the mean, underground stuff had to be done. in, too. I mean, in Ohio winters, people I'm listen, that are going to be listening to this aren't all from Ohio. They could be terrible. Yeah, right. And, and, and we'd had really bad cold winters. Right. More cold where the frost in the ground was like 40 inches. I mean, we were just in bad shape. Yeah. And, and so I remember talking to him. Uh, Mike Gentile and and um, with Murphy Construction and 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 he said 
we'll do our best. And I said, that doesn't work for me. We have and to I remember yeah. tears coming down my face and I'm looking at him and I'm saying, Mike, I said, have I picked the wrong company? Because I said, I need someone that can say it can be done. Yeah. And he looked at me and he smiled. He said, if anybody can do it, we can do it. I right. said, all right, you got the job. So that was at the end of October. We, we, we put the first foundation in, in November 5th. Something I think it was like November that. November 5th, November 8th. Right in there. was the first foundation that we put in. And then we put foundations in for each of the houses each week. And we basically had a system going in. I remember working 120 some days straight. Long story short, we made it um, with one week to spare. We moved. We, we had four we, houses that were ready to be moved. They into. had gotten approved. We had license. Right. We had no, no issues. We had no snow. The first the snow, first snow came the day the last shingle got put on the Correct. last house's yep. roof. Yep. Concrete was gone. It was done. Everything. Was done. I've got pictures on my phone of where we were in the middle of January. It was 59 degrees. Yeah. And I remember just driving every morning saying, God, I mean, thank not you, God. Just, thank not, you, God. I mean, the su- clear skies, sun shining. Right. I will never forget. I watched. This is a true story. I watched them because I wasn't I had made a commitment to myself that I was actually not going to walk on campus right until it was done. Right. Because I had this thing in my head where I'm like, I want I've watched the stress. I've watched the work. I've watched this happen. And I want to have the wow moment. I don't right. want to see it. Right. You, know, you know how like you watch it develop and you kind of lose the, the, the wonder because it's just like you're caught up in the moment. Right. I wanted you to have the opportunity to reveal it to somebody. Right. And that sounded weird. And people were like, well, go see it, see the progress. And I'm like, I don't want to. So it was literally, I mean, I only was on the campus once or twice right. before like, sh- like siding was up and like right. stuff was done. But I do remember driving past and pulling into the street the day that they were finishing the last roof. And I'm not kidding. This is, this is, I'm not exaggerating this because it was only five or six years ago at this mm-hmm. point. Right. That they were putting the last row of shingles on and a flurry started to come down. Yep. Yep. That was the first snow we had had all winter long. Two days before we moved the kids into the property, we had nine inches of snow hit that morning. Right. I um, remember, because if you actually go to safehouserSD.com and look at the website, the pictures of the houses yes. were taken within a week after they were finished. The snow is covering the ground. Correct. Yeah, we had our worst snowstorm the day after we moved in, right? At, which basically shut everything down. And those are all stories by themselves, just with the companies that we've got. And, and God had put a, a, a place within my heart that, we needed to put security on the property from the time that we started because we were in a bad area of Youngstown, worse than what it is now. Um, and um, we were the, we were afraid that we were going to get ripped off and it was going to sh- slow, slow the, the progress. process. So I remember having people there 24 hours a day, um, uh, seven days a week, and we were there pretty much the whole time. So without dragging on and dragging yeah, on. Yeah, there's one we, particular point of this like development of this story that I want you to tell. Um because we had built these four houses right? and we had specifically designed them because in the other properties that we had had, kids were sharing rooms. Correct. And we had bunk, but they were old hospital rooms. So they were big. And so we had, We'd had have room for three to four kids, three to four room. kids in a room, which if you're in a residential facility, that's just, that's pretty normal. And that's how you make more money. But also it could create the potential for different issues, right? right? Cause if kids are experiencing different emotional things right. or traumatic things or whatever, uh, God forbid something worse. And so one of the commitments that you had made was that you wanted each of these houses for a kid to have their own room, their own room. Right. right. So we, and I remember fighting some people on that because they were like, you can make, you more can money. maximize the profit you, yeah, or the, the, the income or whatever. And, you don't, yeah. and I'm like, then why do it? So we're, I want each kid to have their own bedroom. So each house is breaking into, is broken into two sections, two, right. two units of a house with a, with an office for the staff in the middle. And each, each section of the house, each side has six bedrooms. Right. And so each kid, each house fills uh, is filled with 12 kids, each one having their own room. Correct. So we're, in, we're doing this. And when we had moved everybody in, we had, we had still been at that 20, 30 mark. Right. Right. Like we had, we had 48 beds. We were not, we were barely halfway past that. Correct. Um, but there's one kid in particular that, yeah. that what stu- had happened stood was out to this. keep in mind, I'd been there every day except for Christmas morning, I think doing construction and we'd ran two shifts. Um, to get it done. We had an army of people that worked there because everybody knew we had this deadline that we had to hit. And what was neat was I got to share the gospel with so many people because they couldn't believe that God had, um, we were having all this great all weather. All this great weather and like the, the way this, I mean, we're talking breaking ground to building four houses in like 116 days or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, it was amazing. And um, so um, we, we get ready to open, we're moving the kids over and there's this little boy and, and um, he, 
I, you know, just checking on the kids and I'm exhausted by and this. And the time. process of moving kids in this type of situation from one, like they were in this other facility. They, we didn't, it's not like we opened up and the state and the counties were like, here's a bunch of new kids to fill it. No. Like we had brought, we didn't have any new kids no. come at this time. We Correct. were bringing all of the, the right. kids. And this and one the, and the particular little had. boy had just been. We just got his referral. We had just accepted him maybe a week prior. Right, so he didn't have a lot of time with another nope. kid nope. in, in a room. Little skinny kid, just really, um, you know, you could tell that he didn't have a lot of food to eat where, wherever he was at. And I, at this point, because of October through no, uh, February, I'd lost track of where the kids were and what was going on with the you kids. You just let the team run the thing. Right, right. everybody was doing it. I didn't even get over to the other property. And so as we're moving him in, I'm sitting there, and I'm kind of going around, and I'm excited, but I'm exhausted. And I remember him coming up to me. He says, Pastor Bob, I want to show you my bedroom. And I'm like, okay. I've seen, I've seen I've, him. I've seen yeah. him for the last 120 some days. You know, I know what your bedroom looks like. And we had a little bed. You the know, way the rooms are laid out is that way, there's a there's a bed bolted to the floor. Maybe you got a picture you can show. We can show. There's a locker. Yeah. There's a small desk, an extra chair. Right, it's right. just, it's very simple. Little window. And he was like, this is the way I always imagined my bed to look. And this is, I can put a place where I can put my clothes and 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 look, I got a desk and I got a chair and look at my window. He's Pastor so Bob. excited. Yeah, just unbelievable. Like we had just handed him a, a, a just million the best dollars thing that he could ever right. get. I mean, he just went on and on and on. And I was kind of like, yeah, all right, okay, you know. So I'm glad you're happy. You know, this is what I wanted. And I was excited about. It. So I went out to the parking lot. Everybody had been settled in, and I'm ready to go home. And it's kind of washing over me that we had done it. Yeah, at this okay. point. There's and, four months. Yeah, yeah, and we were one week away from going before the Not judge. Not to mention the two or three months leading up to that Correct. beginning process. Right. So we're at six six months of total give or take. chaos. Yeah. Okay. And so I'm kind of excited, and and so I called Courtney on the phone, and I said, Courtney, I said the little guy, I said he was so excited, and she goes, Dad, do you know the story behind him? And I said, No. And she said, Oh, Dad. She said, what did he say? And I said, well, he kept on saying, this is the way I always imagined my bed to look. And look, I got a window, and there's a place to put my clothes, and, 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 and I got carpet on the floor, and this is the way I always imagined it to be. And, and, and she goes, and I could tell that she was getting a little teary. Right, and, she was feeling something. She was feeling yeah. it. And I said, what? And she goes, Dad, he came from a house that was his mother was a hoarder. And I said, okay. And at that time, it still hadn't registered. Yeah, we're just, I mean, we, we've heard bad stories bad of kids stories coming. And, yeah. that, that it was so bad that it, it took him a while to find the boy. That he had made a little tunnel through all the garbage that was from the floor to the ceiling. Upstairs, and in a closet, he had pushed enough stuff aside to create that he like had a nook. A, a nook, like a, a three by three foot place where there was no garbage. And that was his bedroom. There was no heat in the house, and the mom was mentally ill, and she loved cats. And she would, when the cats would die, she would put the cats in the refrigerator, which didn't have any electricity. And he he had a problem where he would act like a cat because he knew he could get the attention. attention. And so all of a sudden she began to say this to me of and and give me the vision of of this house. And I pictured this house just garbage from ceiling to floor all through it, a stink that was there, bugs that's in there, and he had you know made Burrowed. like a little, little yeah. tunnel this is what i visioned in my mind and he had this little place and then all of a sudden the the statement came back from brad to me when i'm sitting on the, in the parking lot and he said this has nothing to do with your faith this has everything to do with god's faith in you and immediately i felt the spirit of the lord begin to speak to me and begin to say could it been bob that you needed to go through this because there was a little boy that was in this little nook that was praying for a bedroom. Right. Could it be that this had nothing to do with you or your ministry, but it had to do with a little boy that had the same story of the little boy that I had talked to at T4C? 30 plus years before. Could it be? And at that moment, both of those stories mixed together inside of me. And, and, and I began to just weep before the Lord and I began to repent. Because, you know, it, it become more selfish to me of like, we're trying to do this. And why, why are we, happening? why are we got yeah. all this problems? And, yeah. and, you know, we got favor from God and God, put, you know, and a lot of people will just be shocked at the half million dollars that came. But, but the end result was the fact that how God processed everything to the place, because there was a little boy that probably was in this bad spot that needed a bedroom. Yeah. And God was like, are you willing? Can I use you 
to answer the little boy's prayer? Can I use you to help the individual? Will you be willing to go through what you're going through that has nothing to do with you, but it has everything to do with me wanting to use your circumstances to help somebody else? Right. And at that point, I realized that it was bigger. The division that I got back in the early 90s was so much bigger than what I could ever be. And and, and so when I look back at it and I combine the two stories together, I realized that God um, wants to use us in dark times. And, it, and a lot of those dark times have nothing to do with us. Right. It has everything to do with someone that he's wanting to touch, like an after-school program where a Brandon will come or an after-school program that will do a, 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 a camp. And we have this little snotty little boy running around and, and then all of a sudden, 20, 30 years later, bam, we're, we're working the vision together. Yeah. And, and there's just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of stories of, that I can use through the history of what we've done to have faith in God yeah. and to trust God on what God wants us to do to help other people. And the neat thing was that we were able to give mom the mental help that she needed. They ended up tearing the house down. Right. She was homeless for a period of time. We got mom so the, the mental this health. Is the kid, this is that same kid's yep, mom. Yep, yep, We got her the mental help that she needed. We got the help that he needed. He, we got him nourished the way it needed to be. And if I'm thinking right, I believe that we were able to put him back Reunite together him. in one way or another right. is what we were able to do. I haven't heard much stories lately on what happened to that little boy, but I know that I'll never forget the excitement that he had. This is the way I always visioned my bedroom to look. That Look, I've got a window that was there. And, and the whole time me feeling selfish through the process right? Uh, that I had to go through all this, you know, when the whole time it, it probably had to do with the little boy. Yeah. You know, it, that, and that can, and so I guess the question I want to ask us today and, and the people maybe that are listening to this is that can, can we, can we get to the point of where God can have faith in us? Yeah. And, and can God have the, the position of what if I, have to do this because there's something else. And I guess I've lived my whole life according to right. that. I mean, and we'll, we'll tell those stories too. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, yeah. And, 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 and so, you know, to kind of, I guess to finish up the story is, is that you, you go through things, you're not sure why you're going through things. And we may never know what those things, why we went through them. Yeah. We may never know. But I think if we'll look sometimes through the eyes of faith that, that, and, and, and we keep our eyes on God, I think he'll reveal different things to us at times. And people might say, well, that's just a far-fetched story. And, and, and maybe where you sit today, it's hard for you to believe that. But we've lived it. Yeah. You know, it, it's not something that we read. It's not something that we wrote that's fictional. It, it's something that there that started with T for C to the place that we opened the main campus of. Right. You know, and, and so um, I just sit here today. I feel so blessed that in the midst of the dark times, and I'm not saying I want to go through anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 it's I'm, not like we welcome I, right, them. Right, like, yeah, I, great. Okay, it's not like I'm sitting here and saying, okay, bring What's on the next? dark times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't want to do that. Um, but in the midst of them, um, there's incredible things that if we'll keep our eyes on God or keep our eyes on the vision. Right. You know, every day for 120 days, I kept my eyes on the vision. Every morning I went in and I prayed over the property saying, God, we need a good day today. Yeah. We, we keep that lake effect snow away from us today. <laughs> right. Get the foundations in today. And, and, and how he surrounded me with the people to accomplish the dream and vision that they don't even realize that they were part of something so much bigger than, than just putting up walls right. or putting a drywall in place. And um, <clears throat> as you can see on this board up here, um, it says changing lives for eternity. That's the that's the overarching vision of what Safe House stands for. Right, is that we want to change lives for eternity. And there's three components that we um, want each resident to know and believe and understand is that there's they're that they're loved, um, that they are nurtured. That we want to nurture them. Yep. And then what's the third? That there's hope for tomorrow. Correct. Right. Correct. And we we when I train new that staff, word hope means a lot to these kids. Right. And a lot of times that's the only thing that. You can leverage well, like they, they a don't, lot of times they don't even know what it is. Right. And they don't know what hope is. And they w once we teach them and we give them that hope, there's this idea where it's like that's the thing that you hang on to. And I'm and we're going to wrap up um, here in just a minute. But I want to encourage you that are listening that I hold this belief that hope is the one one of the only there's only a few things that cannot be taken from you. Right. right? There's a lot of things that can be taken. 
but there's only a few things that they're only gone if you give them away. Right. Right. And hope is one of those things. Right. And it doesn't matter how difficult the situation, how dire the circumstances or how hopeless it seems. Right. Hope is only gone when you give it away. Well, I think hope and faith are intertwined. Right. And, 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 and so when we talk about the word faith, we have to talk about the word hope. You know, what is faith? Faith is hoping for things that you don't see. Right, it's the substance and, of things hoped right. for. Yeah. And and so when you when you look at that hope and understand that hope's there, but there's so many people in the world that get surrounded by the darkness that's around them and they believe the darkness has taken away their hope. Yeah. And and this is something that I talked on Facebook the other day about was was that in the midst of the darkness, there's always light if you look. Right. And it might not be the light you want. Or where it or how or, or you where might not it's get coming to it from as quick as you want. Right. right, but or it's, it's there. coming from a different avenue, and sometimes we'll shut doors <laughs> that God's trying to open right, right. to say, "Wait a minute, it, we're going to do it this way. We're we're going to go around it this way." And and you know, there's so many people that live in the world today that are hopeless because they they don't understand faith. Yeah, and the the strongest part of faith is hope, and if you can keep hope there, every day I, when I went into the property and I realized that this was an impossible task. No one believed that we could do it. No one believed we could do it because we were doing it through winter and there was I mean, no it, way. It wasn't th- supposed to happen. Like, it was an impossible task. It was impossible. You just, you don't do this. No. Right. No. But but every day I kept on saying foundation, house season, starting on foundation of D. I remember you posting I need pictures one more on week, Facebook. God. Yeah. I need one we more talk- week. Yeah. Right. And, and And every day, thankful for what we had. And what we got accomplished. Right. You know, I think there was one day there wasn't any work going on, on campus. And I think it was Christmas Day. Yeah. People that worked was the only day. constantly. Yeah. yeah. Weekends, and, everything. And, you know, just be blessed with the people that's helped us through that that process. And, 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 but hope is everything. Yeah. And, um, you know, when you look at changing lives for eternity, the thing you have to do is you have to look at that child that's sitting on the porch 30 years ago that didn't have any hope. And you can say, okay, how do I bring hope to that individual? All to the place of where you're sitting today with a child that has been removed from their home because of bad situations going on. The first thing that you have to do is you have to give them some type of hope. Right. And and you have to you have to keep placing that hope within them on a daily basis, just like we did on the hope on the campus that was there. Yeah. Well, we got a ton of these stories. And we're going to share them over the next several weeks. We actually had talked before we had started recording that we want to kind of walk through each of those six kind of points, right? You know, we told the sixth one six today. Six dark times. Or like, six... like the benchmark, like like moments where they could have been roadblocks, but they turned out to be stepping stones, Correct. to put it a little generally. Hard times. Right. And so um, we're going to tell those stories, and we're going to meet all the people that are involved in this. And um, what I want to end every episode with a challenge and it usually I, I didn't have it when we started, but I want to end every episode with a challenge. And the one that I want to challenge everybody with today is to ask yourself, like, what is the time or what are the times that you've experienced that have been dark and they've seemed like they were hindrances or like stopping points. Right. But if we approach them in a unique way or a different way, they can actually be things that take us higher and further and better than we could have thought. Like, what are they? You know, you can share right. them with us. And again, you can connect with us on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter. We'd love to hear it. Um, you, If you go to, again, I, I'm not trying to over plug it, but if you go to safehousersd.com, you can connect with us via email. Right. Like there's contact there. We'd, yeah. lo- we'd love to hear it because we want to hear those stories because they like those stories help us too, you sure, know, because like sure. they just encourage and, 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 and they inspire us. And what's we your, wanna, what's your Facebook page? My, me personally, it's just Andy Denon. If yeah. you search Andy Denon, D E N E N, nobody ever <laughs> spells it right. But Mine's if you search Bob, for it, Bob, Bob Denon. Denon, if you look, just connect with us. We'd love to connect. And again, there's a, there's a, there's a safe house one. And then we, we, we would love it. And, um, um, and give us some feedback. Yeah. Please. Let us know what you think. Yeah. Like you can comment on the YouTube page. Um, check out the teddy bear video. Let us know, uh, the, the challenge yourself. What are the dark times that you have experienced that if you're in one now could actually be a stepping stone could actually be something that says it's not so much about challenging your faith in God or your faith in people, but it's more about realizing that God has faith in you, that you're not going to go through something that that you don't have the resources and ability to to make it through if if you don't open your eyes to see it we've we've gone through so much that 
I can sit here with as much confidence I have in my life and say that in the midst of the dark time, God's doing something. He's never not been present. Correct. He's doing something. And and I know that's a cliche, but he's really doing something bigger than you. And bigger than the thing. And bigger than the thing. And I know that in the midst of the darkness, and trust me, in the midst of the dark moment, you can't see that. But when you come out of it, and I believe that it's a stepping stone for the next moment, that God wants to do something greater, that he's preparing you. I think you've got to pass this step yeah. and, and, and look at it from, from the future. Look at it to the past and say, I remember this. And, and, and you're able to walk to the next right. moment is what you're able to do. So I've enjoyed our time today. Yeah, this is great. This is awesome. Uh, so I want to thank Brandon, yeah. engineer, tech, media guy. Appreciate it, man. Absolutely. I'm excited he, about what he's going to do. He didn't fall asleep. No, he didn't. Not at all. I, was, I, didn't. I thought he was going to So now he, get, now he gets the fun part of taking three camera shots and like piecing it all together over the next couple of days. It's going to be a blast. And uh, yeah. we're going to be, we're gonna be uh, again, this is available on iTunes, podcast, Spotify, um, YouTube, anywhere you can get that kind of stuff. Uh, listen in your car, sit down and watch it, share it, give us some feedback. We can't wait to hear it. With that, we're going to wrap up. Bob, Dad, thanks so much. Pastor Bob, Dan at Safe House, appreciate it. This was so much fun. Uh We'll see you next week. We're going to be doing this weekly. Check in, subscribe. See you next time. Bye.